Hello, squirrel friends. I almost forgot. Well, I didn't forget, but I remembered earlier. Then I kind of forgot. But anyway, I'm sitting here, as you can see, in my comfy chair. So, let's read chapter 17, shall we? I don't have anything to drink with me, so we'll see how long I last. It's called Among the Haycocks. H-A-Y-C-O-C-K-S. One word. Uncle Alec did not object, and finding that no one had any claim upon the child, permitted Rose to keep it for a time at least. So little Dolce, newly equipped even to a name, took her place among them and slowly began to thrive. But she did not grow pretty and never was a gay, attractive child, for she seemed to have been born in sorrow and brought up in misery. A pale, pensive little creature always creeping into corners and looking timidly out as if asking leave to live and when offered playthings, taking them with a meek surprise that was very touching. Rose soon won her heart, and then almost wished she had not, for Baby clung to her with inconvenient fondness, changing her forever wail of Marmar into a lament for anti-woes, if separated long. Nevertheless, there was great satisfaction in cherishing the little waif, for she learned more than she could teach and felt a sense of responsibility which was excellent ballast for her enthusiastic nature. Kitty Van, who made Rose her model in all things, was immediately inspired to go and do likewise, to the great amusement as well as annoyance of her family. Selecting the prettiest, liveliest child in the asylum, she took it home on trial for a week. A perfect cherub, she pronounced it the first day, but an infant terrible before the week was over. For the young hero <clears throat> rioted by day, howled by night, ravaged the house from top to bottom, and kept his guardians in a series of panics by his hairbreadth escapes. escapes. So early on Saturday, poor exhausted Kitty restored the cherub with many thanks and decided to wait until her views of education were rather more advanced. As the warm weather came on, Rose announced that Dolce needed mountain air, for she dutifully repeated as many of Dr. Alec's prescriptions as possible, and remembering how much good Cozy Corner did her long ago, resolved to try it on her baby. Aunt Jessie and Jamie went with her, and Mother Atkinson received them as cordially as ever. The pretty daughters were all married and gone, but a stout damsel took their place, and nothing seemed changed except that the old heads were grayer, and the young ones a good deal taller than six years ago. Jamie immediately fraternized with neighboring boys and devoted himself to fishing with an ardor which deserved greater success. Aunt Jessie reveled in reading, for which she had no time at home, and lay in her hammock a happy woman with no socks to darn, buttons to sew, or housekeeping cares to vex her soul. Rose went about with Dolce like a very devoted hen with one rather feeble chicken, for she was anxious to have this treatment work well and tended her little patient with daily increasing satisfaction. Dr. Alec came up to pass a few days and pronounced the child a most in a most promising condition. But the grand event of the season was the unexpected arrival of Phoebe. Two of her pupils had invited her to join them in a trip to the mountains and she went, ran away from the great hotel to surprise her little mistress with the sight of her, so well and happy that Rose had no anxiety left on her account. Three delightful days they spent, roaming about together, talking as only girls can talk after a long separation, and enjoying one another like a pair of lovers as if to make it quite perfect by one of those remarkable coincidences which sometimes occur. 
Archie happened to run up for the Sunday, so Phoebe had her surprise. And Aunt Jessie and the Telegraph kept their secret so well, no one ever knew what maternal machinations brought the happy accident to pass. Then Rose saw a very pretty pastoral bit of lovemaking, and long after it was over and Phoebe gone one way, Archie another, the echo of sweet words seemed to linger in the air, tender ghosts to haunt the pine grove, and even the big coffee pot had a halo of romance about it, for its burnished sides reflected the soft glances the lovers interchanged as one filled the other's cup at that last breakfast. Rose found these reminis re reminiscences <laughs> more interesting than any novel she had read and often beguiled her long leisure by planning a splendor, no, a splendid future for her Phoebe as she trotted about after her baby in the lovely July weather. On one of the most perfect days, she sat under an old apple tree on the slope behind the house where they used to play. Before her opened the wide interval dotted with haymakers at their picturesque, picturesque work. On the left flowed the swift river, fringed with graceful elms and their bravest greenery. On the right rose the purple hills, serene and grand, and overhead glowed the midsummer sky, which glorified it all. Little Dulce, tired of play, lay fast asleep in the nest she had made in one of the haycocks close by, and Rose leaned against the gnarled old tree, dreaming daydreams with her work at her feet. Happy and absorbing fancies they seemed to be, for her face was beautifully tranquil, and she took no heed of the train which suddenly went speeding down the valley, leaving a white cloud behind its rumble concealed the sounds of approaching steps, and her eyes never turned from the distant hills till the abrupt appearance of a very sunburned, but smiling young man made her jump up, exclaiming joyfully, Why, Mac, where did you drop from? The top of Mount Washington. How do you do? Never better. Won't you go in? You must be tired after such a fall. No, thank you. I've seen the old lady. She told me Aunt Jessie and the boy had gone to town and that you were sitting round in the old place. I came on in at once and take a I came on at once and will take a lounge here if you don't mind, answered Mac, unstrapping his knapsack and taking a haycock as if it were a chair. Rose subsided into her former seat, surveying her cousin with much satisfaction. As she said, This is the sur third surprise I've had since I came. Uncle popped in upon us first, then Phoebe, and now you. Have you had a pleasant tramp? Uncle said you were off. Delightful. I feel as if I'd been to heaven or near it for about three weeks and thought I'd break the shock of coming down to earth by calling here on my way home. You look as, as, as if heaven suited you, brown as a berry, but so fresh and happy I should never guess. You'd been scrambling down a mountain, said Rose, trying to discover why he looked so well in spite of the blue flannel suit and dusty shoes, for there was a certain sylvan freshness about him as he sat there full of reposeful strength the hills seemed to have given, the wholesome cheerful days of air and sunshine put into a man and the clear, bright look of one who had caught glimpses of a new world from the mountaintop. Tramping agrees with me. I took a dip in the river as I came along and made my toilet in a place where Milton, Milton's Sabrina might have lived, he said, shaking back his damp hair and settling the knot of scarlet bunch berries stuck in his buttonhole. You look as if you found the nymph, the, the nymph at home, said Rose, knowing how much he liked the cornice. 
I found her here, and he made a little bow. That's very pretty, and I'll give you one in return. You grow more like Uncle Alec every day, and I think I'll call you Alec Jr. Alexander the Great wouldn't thank you for that. And Mac did not look as grateful as she had expected. Very like indeed, except the forehead. <clears throat> His is broad and benevolent, yours high and arched. Do you know if you had no beard? And were your hair long, I really think you'd look like Milton, added Rose. Sure, that would please him. It certainly did amuse him, for he lay back on the hay and laughed so heartily that his merriment scared the squirrel <laughs> on the wall and woke Dolce. You ungrateful boy, will nothing suit you? When I say you look like the best man I know, you give a shrug. And when I liken you to a great poet, you shout. I'm afraid you're very conceited, Mac and Rose laughed too, glad to sit to see him so gay. If I am, it's your fault. Nothing I can do will ever make a Milton of me. Unless I go blind some day, he said, sobering at the thought. You once said a man could be what he liked if he tried hard enough. So why shouldn't you be a poet? Asked Rose, liking to trip him up with his own words, as he often did her. It's Mimi lie, but Mimi's already gone on. Let's see here. Where was I? Glad to see him so gay. Sobering at the thought. You want to sit a man? Why shouldn't you be a poet? Asked Rose. Oh, I just said that. Liking to trip him up with his own words as he often did her. I thought I was to be an M.D. You might be both. There, nev there have been poetical doctors, you know. Would you like me to be such a one? Asked Mac, looking at her as seriously as if he really thought of, of trying, of trying it. No, I'd rather have you one or the other. I don't care which. Only you must be famous in either you choose. I'm very ambitious for you because I insist upon it. You're a genius of some sort. I think it's beginning to. Oops. Beginning to simmer already, and I've got a great curiosity to know what it'll turn out to be. Mac's eyes shone as she said that, but before he could speak, a little voice said, Auntie Woes, and he turned to find Dolce sitting up in her nest, staring at the broad blue back before her with round eyes. Do you know you're Don? he asked, offering his head his hand with respectful gentleness, for she seemed a little doubtful whether he was a friend or stranger. Uh, it's Mac, said Rose, and that familiar word seemed to reassure the child at once, for leaning forward she kissed him, as if quite used to doing it. I picked up some toys for her, by the way, and she shall have them at once to pay for that. I didn't expect to be so graciously received by this shy mouse, said Mac, much gratified, for Dolce was very cherry, chary, C-H-A-R-Y, of her favors. She knew you, for I always carry my home album with me, and when she comes to your picture, she always kisses it. Because I never want her to forget her first friend, explained Rose, pleased with her pupil. First, but not best, answered Mac, rummaging in his knapsack for the promised toys, which he set forth upon the hay before delighted Dolce. Neither picture books nor sweeties, but berries strung on long stems of grass, acorns and pretty cones, bits of rock shining with, uh, shining with mica, several bluebirds' feathers, and a nest of moss with white pe pebbles for eggs. 
Dearest nature, strong and kind, knows what children love and has plenty of playthings ready for them all if one knows how to find them. These were received with rapture and leaving the little creature to enjoy them, enjoy them in her own quiet way, Mac began to tumble the things back into his knapsack again. Two to three books lay near rows and she took up one which opened at a place marked uh, place marked by scribbled paper. Keats, I didn't know you condescended to read anything so modern, she said, moving the paper to see the page beneath. Mark looked up, snatched the book out of her hand, and shook, shook down several more scraps then returned it with a curiously shamefaced expression, saying as he crammed the papers into his pocket, I beg pardon, but it was full of rubbish. Oh, yes, I'm fond of Keats. Don't you know him? I used to read him a good deal, but Uncle found me crying over the pot of basil <laughs> and advised me to read less poetry for a while. I should get too sentimental, answered Rose turning the pages without seeing them, for a new idea had just popped into her head. The Eve of St. Agnes is the most perfect love story in the world, I think, said Mac enthusiastically. Read it to me. I feel just like hearing poetry, and you will do it justice if you are fond of it, said Rose, hauling him the book with an innocent air. Nothing I'd like better, but it is rather long. I'll tell you to stop it if I get tired. Baby won't interrupt. She'll be contented for an hour with those pretty things. As if well pleased with her tank <clears throat> task. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Mac laid himself comfortably on the grass and leaning his head on his hand read the lovely story as only one could who entered fully into the spirit of it. Rose watched him closely and saw how his face brightened over some quaint fancy, delicate description, or delicious word. Heard him heard how smoothly the melodious measures fell from his lips and read something more than admiration in his eyes as he looked up now and then to mark if she enjoyed it as much as he. She could not help enjoying it for the poet's pen po uh, painted as well as wrote and the little romance lived before her, but she was not thinking of John Keats as she listened. She was wondering if this cousin was a kindred spirit. <clears throat> Born to make uh, much music and leave so sweet an echo behind him, it seemed as if it might be, and after going through the rough caterpillar and the pinup chrysalis changes, the beautiful butterfly would appear to astonish and delight them all. So full of this fancy was she that she never thanked him when the story ended, but leaning forward, asked in a tone that made him start and look as if he had fallen from the clouds. Mac, do you ever write poetry? Never. What do you call the song Phoebe sang with her bird chorus? <clears throat> that was nothing till she put the music to it, but she promised not to tell. She didn't, I suspected, and now I know, laughed, uh, laughed Rose, delighted to have caught him. Much discomfited, Matt gave poor Keats a fling and, leaning on both elbows, tried to hide his face, for it had reddened like that of a modest girl when teased about her lover. You needn't look so guilty. It's no sin to write poetry, said Rose, amused at his confession. It's a sin to call that rubbish poetry, muttered Mac with, 
with great scorn. It's a uh, it's a greater sin to tell a fib and say you never write it. Reading so much sets one thinking about such things, and every fellow scribbles a little jingle when he is lazy or in love, you know, explained Mac, looking very guilty. Rose could not quite understand the change she saw in him, but his last words suggest, suggested a cause which she knew by experience was apt to inspire young, young men. Leaning forward again, she asked solemnly, though her eyes danced with fun, Mac, are you in love? And I'm going to stop there. Start to read crazy things like tank for tasks. <laughs> well, it is getting late. It's after 10 bells Eastern. Now I'm here just playing with yarn. Playing with some Noro. And a cotton ripple cake. And I should be working on my wool bag. Woo! See y'all tomorrow, I hope. Live at five. Love you. Be sweet. Don't be ugly. Bye-bye.